6 p.m. Oh, my God. And we're live, and I have to say, Alexa, off. (laughs) My Alexa's going off to tell me that it's time to go live. George Shakiris. Yes, I can say you name. Uh Uh-oh. My Alexa's going off to tell me. And here we See, technical stuff, George. I'm yeah, just that, in that. Yeah, absolutely. Technical stuff. Yeah. Everything's going off at once, but you're here, George. And I am. this is Game Changers with me, Vicki Abelson. My guest today is George Chakiris, and I am so excited. This has been a long time coming, George. Okay. Um, Thank you. Gosh. It's good I'm, to talk to you. I, well, you don't know that yet, but I hope you'll feel that way after after we I, I, I will. I'm sure I will. <laughs> We have so many things in common. I can't dance, but um, you have a Harry in your life, a brother, Harry. Yes. Oh, okay. And my son is Harry. And we lived in Tucson, and I went to college in Tucson. And yeah, you spent time in Tucson, yes? Yes, we did. Yeah, we lived there till I was about uh, 11 or so. where did you go to school? I was a, t- a, a drama teacher in Tucson. Where did you go to? Uh, where did you go to school? What, what a good question. I don't remember where I went to school. <laughs> we got there. We moved there from when I was three. And right. We went, to, we went to Tucson, and we lived there till I was uh, till I was eleven. I went to school. Uh, I, I just don't remember the the name of the school. Uh, well, you were little. I, I don't. Yeah. Well, of course, I get it. It, but okay, so George, how were they? You know, I didn't even realize that you were of Greek descent. Jakiris, you'd think I'd know that. Yeah. You know, I always I bought into the whole Puerto Rican thing a hundred percent. But how did they treat you back then as a Greek? And because when I went to Tucson as a Jew in 1973, uh-huh. one girl felt my head to see if I had horns. I kid oh you, I kid you. So how were they being, I would assume you were one of the only Greek families there. Oh, yeah, a totally Greek family. My parents uh, emigrated to this, or, you know, immigrants to, to, right. to this country. Uh, nothing like that. I I experienced nothing like that in school. I but uh, I can, I, from your description, and isn't that a horrible, how do, how do kids learn these things? their parents which is really scary um i guess um and and so were you were you dancing when you were in you weren't dancing yet when you were in tucson were you no i I took my i i didn't learn uh anything about dancing till i we moved to long beach california we moved here to long beach when i was uh, i think i was 12 or 13 something and i didn't take my first dance class until I was 19. Okay, that's, that's, that is absolutely ridiculous. Okay, but you, you could, da- you, you could move, you, uh, you had to be moving your whole life. You had to be. Well, I, 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 there was a, a, a girl, Joan Scanlon, who was a dancer. And in high school, she was a, a well-known girl because everybody loved to watch her dance. And uh, the guy who was her partner uh, joined, I'm hearing another voice somewhere, but uh, the, the guy who was her partner uh, joined the Coast Guard. So she needed somebody to, to partner her for these high school assemblies. And she asked me, so I started working with her uh, as a dancer, uh, uh, partnering her for school stuff. And right. she, she was the one who told me about this incredible school dancing school in hollywood called the american school of dance and that's where i took my first class when i was 19 thanks to joan how is it possible that you weren't studying all those years and just a couple of years later you're you're a dancer in major motion pictures how is that even possible well i'll I'll tell you uh, i had i have four sisters and two brothers and one of my sisters catherine liked me just when we were kids and two years, loved dancing. And, and she, uh, later in life, she married when she was about 18 or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she, uh, so she was the housewife, so to speak. But she always kept up dancing because she loved it as much as I did. She became a really competitive ballroom dancer. And oh, she, wow. she was a beautiful dancer. So the two of us had that in common. Did you grow up in a house of music? Were your parents musical? Did they... 
Not, not particularly. I, I don't know how that happened because uh, they certainly appreciated everything we did and they were supportive of everything we wanted to do, all of us. Uh, but I can't say that we grew up in a, in a musical kind of family where we, we were hearing music and pay, paying attention to, to music. You know, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing another voice right now and I don't know why. I, I'm uh, only hearing the two of us. Um, uh, I'm going to ask everybody out there in Facebook land, are you guys hearing? Uh, oh, I think maybe if I turn on the volume on this phone, that will do it. Oh, your phone is on. That's why. Yeah, you have to turn your phone volume down because you're hearing it from two places. I turned it off, but I'm, I'm still hearing that voice. Hmm. It's not bad. It's not bad. Well, I don't want you to. I don't. It's, I'm sure it's, it's distracting. Not. It's not yeah. letting me turn the phone off for some. Uh, as long as, hmm, strange. You know the tech world. I just got. Uh, but the bottom line, I can hear you. That's what matters. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. But I, I, I don't want you to be driven crazy while we're talking. No. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to ask everybody out there in Facebook land if they can hear a double, and and I'll try to figure out what the hell it is. Hopefully not. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so George, I would imagine what, 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 okay. So if you did start taking dance class, you were 19, what was the dream before then? When you were a kid, what was the, what was the hope? What was the dream? Wow. Seeing movie musicals as a kid from five years old or whatever, I, you know, that was an escape for, for all, most, most kids loved going to the movies on weekends, you know, mm -hmm. the, the serials on Saturday, all, all that stuff. So I fell in, I didn't realize it was happening, but I absolutely fell in love with that world. And that was what I looked forward to doing every weekend. That was, that was, uh, yeah. And um, uh, going to school, uh, junior high school, even high school, I quite often would ditch school <laughs> to go downtown and see a movie. So I, I fell in love with movie movies that way. Wow. And, and do you, did you have a favorite like the first musical I saw on Broadway was Oliver when I was about eight and it changed my life. Do you remember like the first musical or one that really stood out for you as a kid? Well, it wasn't the first one, but one that really stands out to me is a, a movie with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, their first color musical called The Barclays of Broadway. Wow. I, think I, was, I think I was about 10 when that, when that came to town and I, I, I couldn't wait to see this movie, you know, <laughs> and um, I did get to see it. I took the bus downtown Long Beach, saw the movie, loved every second of it. And on the bus on the way home, my, my neck was getting uncomfortable. I had the mumps. So I saw the movie just in time. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do. I remember that, that I, to me, I guess in a way that I, that was the first movie that sort of paid attention to it in a serious way because i really did love it yeah wow there's somebody now ringing my door but is there anything else like i, I got a, a an email from con edison telling me that they might turn my electricity off on thanksgiving i'm cooking dinner george what are you having <laughs> but i might not have electricity what, what are you doing for thanksgiving Oh, well, I'm going to go, oh, you know, um, Larry Mirish, who is uh, Walter Mirish's son, is a really good friend of mine. He was three years old when we did West Side. But, wow. But, but he's now a really good friend. So I'm going over to uh, uh, his home uh, with his girlfriend and having a, we'll do something quiet. Yeah. Okay. So now last year, we were in the middle of a pandemic and I literally cooked a turkey and put it in my car and drove it to my son's backyard because oh. we couldn't be inside. Uh, what did you do last year for Thanksgiving? Did you have a Thanksgiving at all? We were in the middle of a pandemic. You know, I, I, my neighbors invited me to a, a Thanksgiving dinner once at their home. I don't know if it was last year or the year before. Uh, the truth is I don't really remember. You know, I think because of the pandemic, most of us were home. I know it was going really, anywhere. Yeah. Are you? How are you handling? Well, okay, so when the pandemic hit, um, did you have things scheduled that you had to cancel? And how how did you fare being home? Well, uh, the thing that I think I and all my all of us felt was 
that we uh, we couldn't see each other the way we used to. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there was a long time of most of us being alone and uh, not able to visit because everybody we were all a little nervous about it and. Uh, and then uh, when it eased up a bit and we did, we did start to see each other very carefully, always outdoors, right. a few people. And we all felt, we all realized how great it was to finally get to see each other, you know, and how we missed each other. Yeah. And you're part of that whole Harlan Bowl, going to a lot of stuff all the time and seeing like the whole group of, of friends and, yeah. um, and, but you guys are kind of back to, are you back to fairly normal living now? Cause I'm not, but I, you guys seem to be. Yeah. I, I think, I, I think people are back to being active again, but the, the people I know are still doing it outdoors and not as many people. Yeah. Right. So everybody's still being careful. Um, yeah. And also we uh, just last night, uh, you know, the news is telling us, you know, be careful. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. I know. We, I uh, we'll, we'll get out of it. We just have to all remember to be patient. It'll be okay. And we all have to pay, play our part, so to speak. I mean, I've been vaccinated twice. I've, I, I've gotten the booster. I've, I've done that. And I'm, I appreciate people who have done it. And I worry about people who have not done it, you know. I agree. They're, they're not helping. Yeah. I know they're not helping and they're hurting, as a matter of fact, making it harder because there's all these breakthrough cases of COVID with people who are vaccinated from people who aren't. So that's yeah, yeah. yeah pretty horrible. So did you were you able to utilize your time um, during that year? Were you able to be productive? Did you just have fun being I mean, well, what did you do with yourself? I, I suppose I was less productive in some ways, but I, um, you know, got a long time ago, I started, I uh, got interested in making jewelry. So I developed and have a jewelry collection that I sell online. So I guess the pandemic gave me more time to do that, you know, make, make a few more pieces because you need time to do everything. So, but that was the only benefit I, I'll say uh, from the pandemic uh, with, with my time was having more time to address uh, and, and use for creating more pieces. And I love your jewelry line. I love silver. It's, uh, yes, I have silver all over. Yeah. Um, silver, yeah. And, I, there, and I saw something in your collection that I'm eyeing that I'm going to have to see if Santa's going to bring me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like your love and hope collection. I love it all. But, but yeah. uh, yes. Um, yeah, so yeah. What, how did that get started, George? What inspired you to start a jewelry collection? Well, I, you know, I can't remember. I, I th there's a, a wonderful sort of university downtown at, at Barnsdall University. It's a smaller place uh, where, on certain days of the week, they teach uh, painting, sculpting, uh, jewelry making. They teach all of those things. they cool. and I found out about it and went uh specifically interested in uh in uh in jewelry making uh -huh. so th that was those were the first classes i took and i remember the t you know because of course uh, uh, the price of all metals are more now than they were then but i remember the teacher saying don't waste don't spend your money on gold you're learning don't spend just stick with silver so I stuck with silver and really fell in love with silver, and that's I and I I I kept, I stuck to silver. I really love it. Yeah, I do as well, and I love the, the fact that you have nice heavy, yeah, heavy pieces there. Yeah, and, yeah. And I, I I love the the re reflective part of, of of I mean it it really does shine. Yeah, I, and you're not wearing any jewelry right now to show off your line. <laughs> Say that again. I'm sorry. You're not wearing any jewelry right now to show off your line. I'm. 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 Let's see. Well, here's a ring. It's, it's my GC logo ring. If you can see it. Oh yes, I can. It's. I love your logo collection. Uh, and, uh, by the way, using this same design, mm -hmm. I, I've used this uh, for cufflinks. I've used it for uh, a necklace because all joined together, it makes a beautiful necklace as well. So I just have something, a couple of things over here that are need work. Show, uh, show us, show us what you've got sitting there besides the ring. Do you have anything else sitting in front of you? Uh, let, let me see. Uh, there's some stuff in this dish here. Um, let's see what I've got. 
Uh, There's a toggle bracelet that I love. It's like a link toggle bracelet. It's wonderful. Uh, well, here's something I'm working on. Uh, it's not finished. Uh, this is a. Uh, 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 this will be, it could be a pin, it could be a pendant, and of course it will have a, a stone in the middle. It could be either have turquoise or a faceted stone in here. Uh, so uh, this is a, uh, but I, I, this is, I'm working George, on it. wait a minute, you're working on it. How, how, how do you design this? How do you, what do you do? What's your just, part of this? You know, you just sit, uh, sit down uh, for, for designing. Right. Um, with paper and pencil, and you, you just start drawing. And and uh, you find that it's a great way to start to, wow, I have something else that I, I'd love to show. I don't have it here in front of me, but um, here's, oh, oh, I didn't know I had this here. This is a, a necklace, I think. Oh, um, I have to have a piece of uh, the, the George Chikiris uh, 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 <laughs> called the, the Take Five necklace. Uh, yes, but and it has uh, stones, colored stones. So it, it, this is kind of a nice piece. If, it's uh, gorgeous, and you have a bracelet like that as well. I saw online. I do have a bracelet, like that. and uh, I have uh, I've made earrings from these, one drop or two drops or three drops. Gorgeous. So it, it, what was what's great about this jewelry is you can take. A, a, a link. What we would take one piece, right? And find and find quite a few ways to use it. Um, I've, I've, I know one more thing here I can show you, which is a. Uh, 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 David Zimmerman says hello, and he looks forward to seeing you on December 11th at the Hollywood Museum. Hi, David. <laughs> yeah. Here's a. Uh, here's here are earrings. A double. Uh, they're still in the plastic, but uh, uh, that's not good. Uh, I'm almost got it. These are earrings from the very same link. Just simple uh, uh, two two drop uh, link uh, earrings. If you can see those to higher. Uh, oh yes, I do. It, and, it's the same link. And that's I that's the bracelet that I saw the top. Now people are telling me I'm too. I took my microphone out, so now we're, I'm having all kinds of sound issues. They're saying I'm in a tunnel, I sound too loud. All right, I'm gonna to try to modulate. I love that bracelet, that toggle bracelet that you just held up. That's the oh, one I'm eyeing right now. This one? Gorgeous. Yeah, uh, see on this one, and this one has a, this one has a really nice, yeah, this toggle, I, I, I made all this stuff myself. And once I make- Wait a minute, it, how do you make it? Uh, because I, I, I've learned how to solder and work with silver and cut. You literally make the jewelry yeah. yourself? Yes, I do. Once I make a piece, then we make a mold. And, yeah. And then we're able, to, <laughs> we're, excuse me, we're able to duplicate things. But I, I love this toggle because I, I remember how long it took me. It, it, but at, there's a G, there's a C at one end and a G at the other. And it took me forever to work that out and solder it on. But I, I love this toggle. Okay, so now can you make a custom piece? Because I saw you have, a, I'm sorry, everybody out there, this is personal. You have a pendant that's a, that has a heart hanging off of it and it has a toggle. Do you know which piece yes. I'm talking about? Uh, it, it's, it's a link, it's a chain link and it has a little, it has a heart, you, one of your hearts hanging off of it. Yeah, yeah. It has a I don't, have, I don't have that here. But all right, but what I want is I want that as a bracelet. That's what I want. I love that. A, a few people have asked me about that, so I I have to take that design and make make a bracelet from it. I haven't done that, that yet. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the one I really want. I love. I lo you use your heart is very unusual. Yeah, I, I like the heart thing. The, the, you, look, it's funny what I'm finding in this dish. You see, all, all these pieces here are uh, 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 what we will make molds from to make that heart bracelet. It's all this stuff right here. Right. Any sense at all. No, it does. I totally get it. I can't believe that you're actually a silversmith. I had no idea. I thought you were just drawing. I made, I made quite a few uh, pendants. I used seven, seven as, the, uh, as, the, as the design. I love that too. And what's the I significance thought, of seven for you? Yeah, I, I, I've always thought of, for no reason, I like uh, I like the number seven, so that's a very that's a good enough reason. <laughs> uh, 
Um, ask me what your jewelry website is. If you if you Google uh, George Takiris jewelry, it, it comes up because that's how I found it today. Uh, the, see, I don't know if you can see this. Hold it up a little higher, George. See, yes. It has a seven design. I see it. Yeah. Three sevens. So I've used uh, seven in different ways. Anyways, so I, I've just remembered this. Oh, here's, I'll tell you one more thing. You know, I did the, uh, I did this rectangular GC logo. Wait, hold it up a sec. This is a, the rectangular oh, yeah. GC it's logo. Gorgeous. Yes. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. I also did a circular one, which I haven't used yet, except for this. And, um, but these little, these little. Ah, this, are, I, what is this called? A nice soft bracelet. It's gorgeous. What is that called? The, uh, that's another GC logo that I haven't used yet. We're oh, still, we're still working on this one, but this is soft and flexible. You know, well, you do that, and it's you know, I like the toggle ones because I can do that myself. Yeah, exactly. the bracelets that you have to do the the link. I can't yeah. put that on myself. Yeah, well, a lot of people, a lot of people feel like you, and people love toggles. And you're right; they're much easier to work with. Yeah. But the only thing is, sometimes I've lost, not yours, but I've lost bracelets with toggles because they, if they don't have a, a long enough piece, yeah. they fall off. But yeah, yours they won't do that. They, they, they can't, yeah. <laughs> I'm betting yours won't do that. So now everybody wants to go to, everybody is asking me about your website. They're going to go to <laughs> buy some jewelry. This is great season for jewelry. I'm, I'm glad you asked, and I have that stuff sitting over there. I am All too. It needs work. Yeah. Well, it's all fabulous. And I really do hope you make that bracelet with the heart because I want one of those. I really do. I love that bracelet. I love that thing. Thank you. I, I think that's a nice one too. Yeah, I, I like that one. So George, what is, so were you, were you a consumer of jewelry? Did, what, what inspired you to start a jewelry line? Uh, you know, the, the, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember how, what, uh, how to answer that question, and I don't really have an answer, but it, it seems to me somewhere mm -hmm. I, I met a, 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 some woman I was working with on something, and I, I think I admired something she was wearing, uh -huh. and it, that's what got me to that school to learn how to make jewelry, you know. Uh, and, and, but once I was in class, I mean, that was it, then I was really hooked. And I just, I really loved it. And you know, one of the, one of the great things about jewelry, it's, you know, uh, uh, actors and actresses, performers, they, what they do, what they do for an audience. And they hope they, in the course of doing it, that they will please an audience. And it's the same with jewelry. You make something, you hope that somebody's going to like it, you know? Right. So this, oh. this is a, this is that heart ring. That's gorgeous. Wait, hold it up a little higher, George, so we can see it. This one has hold a it. pave on one side. Hold it up a little high. There you go. Yeah. It's oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah. Oh, and that mat that matches my shirt exactly. It does. It does. Ah! <laughs> anyway, so I have this dish full of stuff here that needs work, and so I'll I'll, I'll keep working. <laughs> You've got to keep working because I love this stuff. And actually, when when this is really over and I go back to having literary salons in my home, you'll come with your book and your jewelry. And I have 50 women here and they're going to buy your stuff like crazy. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Thank oh. you. Thanks so much. Oh, absolutely. We will definitely get to that. Uh, um, so in the meantime, you can get George's jewelry online, though. You can go to, uh, is it georgejakiris.com? What is, is, what's your jewelry? Yes, that's right. Georgejakiris.com. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's the way you can find his jewelry now, just in time for the holidays. So let's get back to to sw to swoony uh, actor dancer George Shakiris. That oh my god, I heard they made you. I was reading in your book that they. Uh, by the way, George's book, um, My West Side Story, is phenomenal. I was up till two thirty in the morning reading last night. Thank it you. is. Thank I cannot believe the people that you have. Spent yeah. life in the company of yeah yeah me too, me too. and work with and what I was saying to you earlier is that I love that your humility and that you are still a fan and the way you speak okay so I wanted to talk about because you turned down an opportunity for a role so that you could be a chorus dancer 
with Rosemary Clooney. Is that correct? That's right. That's what, right. Well, I, didn't, I, I didn't turn down a role. Uh, a, a friend of mine who was already in, who was already playing one of the brothers in uh, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, <coughs> wanted me to go over and audition for Michael Kidd, who was choreographing that that film. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't want to do it because I, I had heard about this number with Rosemary Clooney coming up. I, I hoped I could be one of those four guys. Anyway, I did audition twice for Michael Kidd. I gave a lousy audition because uh -huh. I, did, I didn't want him to pick me and he didn't. So You're kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I am I embarrassed myself, but I just didn't know how to keep my friend Matt Maddox asked me to, you know, please audition for Michael Kidd and so I've, I didn't. I didn't want to be rude to to Matt, so of course I went, and I just gave a bad audition. So nobody would have picked me for anything, but and so that meant I was available for that number with Rosemary Clooney, if if it happened, and luckily it did. You know, yeah. And what an iconic performance that is, and and what beautiful oh, the, the photographs alone. Forget the dance, just the the image of you and Rosemary. Yeah. Um, I'm friends with Bridget Clooney, and she told me she had a meal with you a few years ago. Uh -huh. um, I think it was, might have even been a Thanksgiving meal, she said. Um, but anyway, um, Rosemary. Uh, oh, God, she was so darling. Uh, uh, uh -huh. um, so, okay, but it started um, uh, for you, King, not, no, 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 Son of Love, with Catherine Hepper. You started with Catherine Hepper? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, I was I was singing in a, a boys' choir in a church choir every Sunday uh, at a, an Episcopal church in uh, Long Beach. I sang with that choir while I while I was still a boy soprano for wow. about, <laughs> for about four years. And they over the years that choir had sung in quite a few movies. So while I was with the choir, we we did it to be in a a concert sequence in the back, the choir in the back. Um, of a movie called Song of Love with Catherine Hepburn and Paul Henry and Robert Walker. So it was this big, huge concert scene in, in a, the great uh, theater set at MGM. It was beautiful. Uh, so it was a full orchestra, a adult choir on one side uh, and, and us in the back. And so that was, that was my first time actually in a movie studio. And that was an incredible experience. I, I'm sure you can imagine, you know. Yeah. So I, I was just a, 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 a choir boy, but that was the first time I was on a movie set. Yeah. So, okay. So then how did it, so how did it next as I, because then you became, then you started dancing in film after that. Is that how it? Well, uh, again, as I was singing in the choir, I was about uh, 11, 12 to maybe 15, something like that. So I continued living in Long Beach. I finished uh, high school, and I went to Long Beach City College for uh, just because I, I went to Long Beach City College. But Joan Scanlon, the girl that asked me to dance with her, I had a huge crush on her, so <laughs> I just followed her wherever she went. You know? <laughs> so, so, and she, her mother wanted her to have an education, so she went to City College, and so I did too. Hysterical. And, yeah. And, and again, thanks to Joan and her mother, I guess they were visiting Hollywood, but they, she, it was Joan who found out about the, this uh, school, the American School of Dance in, uh, on Hollywood Boulevard in, in Hollywood that was, it wasn't really a, a, a great, great, serious uh, ballet dancing. Uh, they, they taught everything, but it was all, all the ballet companies from when they came from New York, wherever they came from to perform in Los Angeles, always took class at this school that, that and that's how good a school it was wow so 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 I, again i started late but i didn't know it was late i just took something i loved doing um and i was and i was having a great time <laughs> i was yeah. so george how did you okay so then you started taking dance with joe you follow joe and you're taking the dance how did that turn into a film role for you how, how did that do what sorry how did how did how did dancing with joe how did taking dance class do you must have taken a ton of dance classes well, because uh, you can uh, do you so know, much uh, whatever whatever she did um uh, uh something for the kids a, a school assembly she, uh, again her uh the guy who <laughs> excuse, excuse me had <coughs> had been her partner mm -hmm joined the coast guard so she asked me to, to dance with her and i did dance with her for one 
uh, high school assembly. And I was really nervous, but I remember how wonderful it all felt. It was just an incredible experience to be, to do that with her on, to be on stage for, for all the kids and, and, and have it work, work out well, not make any mistakes. And the reception was so, I mean, that, that really, I, I can remember that as if it just happened yesterday because it, it was a, a, a powerful experience at that stage of the game, you know? And so what classes did you, did you take everything? Did you take ballet, jazz? Did you take everything? Well, uh, you know, uh, again, when Joan told me about the American School of Dance, uh, the, the, here's what she said about it. She said, Sid Charisse and Leslie Caron take class there. Well, that's all I had to hear. So right. I took the train down one morning from Long Beach and I watched a professional class, 1130. Nobody famous in class, but it didn't matter to me. I knew that I had to take class at that school. So I got a job as an office boy in the advertising department for the maid company downtown. I got a place to live and, and I started taking class every day. And that's, and I took, I've taken class almost every day since then, you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, never so. yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Do, you st do you still, do you, do you still? No, not, not that I, I, it's not that I've gotten lazy. I guess I have gotten a little lazy. It's just that, you know, with time and you know, you're not as, because uh, it's good to be, uh, when you're working your, your body that way, you're better off if you're still on the young side. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, you can keep doing it, but then you become more limited in time. And to me, it was only fun. Same with singing, if I could really do it. I, di I didn't like doing doing less. So I, I still exercise, but I go to the gym and I do my own thing, so to speak. Uh, and, and also the, the good, uh, good thing about, go we, you know, if you go to a class, you, you have to be at that class at that time. Right. Uh, if you go to the gym, you can do it on your own time. So it's easier to actually get it done. Uh, but I, the, the best form of exercise has always been dance. It, it, it really is the best. So what did you do during the pandemic when you couldn't go to a gym? Did you find a way to exercise while you were home? Well, I, I, I go to the gym uh, maybe just twice, maybe three times a week now. <coughs> Excuse me. I got a cut. <clears throat> and um, I, I use uh, some of the, the equipment in the gym. But the thing that I end my exercise with is stretching, uh, dance exercises, because to me, they're still the best. Uh, but it, it's the good thing about working. It's good to be warm for your body to be warm so that you can stretch because you shouldn't try to stretch if your body isn't already warm. But then uh, anyway, so uh, I still I always include some dance exercises, uh, even when I go to the gym. Yeah. But when the gyms were closed during the pandemic, did you still find a way to exercise? Uh, no, it, it, I, I, cause I'm not good at, ex I don't, I'm not good at making my, myself exercise at home. Yeah. I, I have to be in a place and I have to be with other people. And if I can, cause that, that there's a different energy in the room. Mm -hmm. So with the pandemic, not just me, so, so many of us uh, uh, were exercising less yeah. And it was so great when the gyms did open again so we could get back to it. But the pandemic did change it for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So let's get back to the dance. So, so you've danced with, oh my God, you, you, with Marilyn, you danced with Marilyn. Oh my <laughs> so that's crazy. Right. How did that happen? Well, uh, again, I was just, uh, I was, uh, uh, after, after my, very first job as a my first job as a as a dancer in movie musicals was uh, in a, in a movie called The Five Thousand Fingers of Doctor T, mm -hmm. and I wasn't in the union, but but because the choreographer needed uh, quite a few male dancers for this sequence, some of us who were not in the union got to audition. <laughs> and once he used this and we worked, we were then able to join the union and then start auditioning for other things. 
And that's when I auditioned for White Christmas and I got to audition for uh, General for Blondes. And I, I, I really do love being, I think it's so much fun to be able to say that I was one of the guys behind Marilyn Monroe and that, that number, it's a great number. It's and a course, fabulous number. I it, watched it, it really a few times today. Jack, Jack Cole, the man who choreographed it, was her absolute her favorite choreographer. She worked with him whenever she could. She, uh, I think Ritter of No Return. He worked with her on that as well. Uh, but anyway, Jack Cole created this really beautiful number, and she's you know she's just so beautiful in it. You know, yeah. How how was she to work with? Uh... Yeah. Well, uh, you know, she was very quiet mm -hmm. and really uh, uh, looking back, she didn't waste, her, I'm sure she wasn't thinking of it as wasting her time. She was just so concentrated on her work. She was quiet and that's what she was there for. Uh, whenever they uh, cut for any reason, she didn't check herself in the mirror and she didn't go to her dressing room. She went right back to her starting position to start again. Wow. And that to, that to me really uh, uh, showed how uh, committed she was to her work. You know, and I, I really admired that about her. Yeah. And there's a story in your book that she kind of insisted on Jack Cole choreographing something that he was not the chore choreographer of. Isn't that correct? Wasn't there? Wait, I, I, I hear this other voice still and it's, it's getting in my way. So ask me that again. Okay. Is it, wasn't there a situation where uh, Marilyn insisted that Jack Cole choreograph a number, even though he was not the choreographer of the film. That's right. In in no business like show business, uh, the choreographer for for that movie was Robert Alter, one of the mm -hmm. great theater and movie you know, he, Easter Parade. I mean, so 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 much. Uh, and uh, she wanted Jack Cole for the Heat Wave number. Mm -hmm. So what what he did to to uh, to try to convince her, he staged a heat wave number for her. He he, uh, and he was using a, a a dance, a male dancer to partner her. And uh -huh. he had four guys in the back. And in and that version of his version of the heat wave number, well, I got to be one of the four guys. So it it took him about four weeks four weeks to create this number for her. And then one day she came in by herself quietly very polite very sweet and we did that that version of the heat wave number for right. her and she said thank you very nice you know and then and and then left but jack cole ultimately did the heat wave number for her in that movie and robert alton was great but she was absolutely she was so right to wow. insist that Jack Cole do that number because it, it, it was a very different style and really much more suited to her. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So George, how did you go from being a gypsy in all of these films? And there were so many, you danced with Rosalind Russell, you, dan you danced with so many movie stars. How did you go from being a gypsy chorus dancer to being an Academy Award winning actor. Oh, well, How the hell does well, that happen? Well, uh, you know, in somewhere in the 50s, <clears throat> um, work for dancers was kind of drying up in Los Angeles. There wasn't much happening. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got this tiny bit of a cold or something. <clears throat> I'll just, anyway, so I thought, I, I thought I better go to New York. So I bought a one-way ticket to New York. And I had some friends who had already been there before me, and they put me up on the couch in their living room, so I had a place to stay. And they knew everything that was going on in New York. Mm. Uh, West Side Story was just uh, reaching its first year uh, run on Broadway, and the word was out that they were forming a London company. So these, these two girls, Drusilla, my good friend Drusilla said, she told me to go to the, the Winter Garden Theater where West Side Story was playing. And she, uh, she said, ask for Ruth Mitchell. Ruth Mitchell was the stage manager and she later became Hal Prince's associate producer. Mm -hmm. So they told me to do that, go to the stage door, ask for Ruth Mitchell. So one evening, uh, I went, the show was almost over and I went to the stage door and the first person I saw was a guy called Howard Jeffrey, who had been a star pupil at the American School of Dance. I didn't know him well, but right away I saw a friendly face. 
Right. And he was great. He had been working with Jerry, uh, assisting him on, on West Side Story for the theater. He introduced me to Ruth Mitchell and she looked at me and she said, I think you should read for Bernardo. So she gave me a script and set up a time for me to audition for Jerry. And uh, during, he was, uh, he was rehearsing Ballet as USA. So during one of his lunch breaks on whatever day it was, I went over and read the role of Bernardo. And then after I did that, he asked me to look at the role of Riff. So I went, took 20 minutes, went back in the wings and looked at the room and then came back and read uh, Riff for him. And then he asked me to learn Cool. Uh, in, the, in the theater version, Cool is sung by Riff. Mm -hmm. um, so I, they gave me the sheet music and I worked on, this is a long answer to your question, uh, but I worked on Cool, came back a week later and did that for him. And, then, and eventually I was cast as Riff in, in the London Company. So that, that was my first time uh, working as an actor uh, because in, in West Side Story, one of the uh, primary uh, things you had to be, you had to, you had to be able to dance. Yes. But of course, you had to be able to act too. But so that, had that you, was had my... you studied acting, George? No, I hadn't. No, not, not at all. Oh my! No. And you win no. the Academy Award in your yeah. first role. That's... Well, I'll, I'll tell you, it, it's such a great play. There are <laughs> such good parts, uh, and, and uh, the way we all cared uh, about West Side Story in the theater before the movie. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't do West Side Story and not feel deeply about it. It's just one of those pieces, you know. So mm -hmm. I became really committed to what I was doing. Uh, I got really good reviews playing Riff in London, too, you know, wow. uh, out of the blue. Um, so so then uh, so I continued playing Riff, did, then did the movie, playing Bernardo, then went back into the show and continued playing a Riff. Uh, and uh, at the end, before we had finished, uh, filming on West Side Story, the marriage company who produced it signed me to a picture deal. I mean, I didn't know anything, but there I was with a picture deal, you know. So uh, my first movie after West Side Story, and this sounds, I don't sound pompous here, it's just the way it happened. I, I was suddenly, really suddenly, starring above the title with Yul Brenner and Richard Widmark, yeah. you know. <laughs> so I was, so things, just, I was lucky the way things happened a really serendipitous way for me. And uh, so, uh, and I took everything I did really seriously and hoped that I was going to be good enough. And, but that, that was, I, 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 of course, went into uh, studying acting. Okay, I that was done it before. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That is just, and you, you acted opposite Charlton Heston. I mean, you've, you've done an incredible, you've had an incredible body of work. Um, Yvette Mimieux, uh, um, I, I was watching all the clips today. There's, I can you did so many films and you've worked with so many people and you've yeah. been phenomenal in all of this stuff. And to have had so little training, this natural gift that you have um, as a dancer and as an actor is, yeah. did, did you, Okay, so you were in choir when you were a kid. Did you take singing lessons? <coughs> no, I, 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 I think that it sounds kind of pompous to talk about yourself, uh, but, but uh, I, I really think that movement uh, and singing and even acting ultimately came naturally to me. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I wasn't stuck. Uh, it, yeah, I had something to uh, that got me going, and it was just the, a, a natural uh, understanding and ability that that helped me get through things even before I studied. Uh, and by the way, doing the show in London for a year and a half playing riff that that was that was studying. That wasn't just doing a show because you were learning constantly, you know. I and we're working with Jerry Ro working with Jerry Robbins. I mean. Boy, you have to step up to the plate with him, you know. That's yeah. being schooled, I'm sure. Yeah. So how did incredible. you go from being um, from being Riff to going back to being Bernardo, which is what they originally saw you as? Yeah. And they darkened your skin. They must. Have. Uh, for for the movie, they did a, a little bit, not a lot, but they did. Yeah. And and you know, 
Uh, I, I, in today's world with Spielberg's West Side coming out any minute, uh, people are paying, uh, I think, kind of a, a silly kind of attention to makeup. And uh, I mean, it, 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 there are two things, I think, uh, in West Side Story that are important for the audience, mm -hmm. to, visual things. One of them is, is uh, costumes. Iron Sheriff did the costumes for mm -hmm. West Side Story and a lot of other things had different colors from sharks that she had for the Jets. Right. That's, that's very smart because then an audience can see who's who without being told every two minutes. Right. The same, the same with the skin tone. If you just change it slightly, not much, just a little, you don't even have to change it really. The clothes really do it. Right. But, but, uh, but for film, uh, that, and by the way, it's important not just in West Side Story, but like tons of movies uh, where actors were darker because they, I can remember I did a movie called Kings of the Sun with Yul, with Yul Brenner. And he, they darkened him quite a lot because he played an American Indian, but it wasn't wrong to do it. It wasn't, ra it was none of this racist stuff that they seem to be wanting to talk about today. It, it was just the right thing to do, you know. Right, I got you. And how fortuitous that you, they didn't cast you as Riff in the film because you might not have had the same course had that. I mean, you were meant to be Bernardo. That was meant to be. Well, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, I, I, I loved playing Riff in the theater. I, I really, I really, and, and here's a, Riff in, in the theater mm -hmm. is a slightly better role than the role of Bernardo in the theater. Um, in the, the in the film version of West Side Story, um, Bernardo's the ro role of Bernardo is is enhanced because the guys are included in the American number and a few other things. So there's more meat on the bones and more fun between right. them and the girls and all of that. But I I, I see your your point about uh, because I'm got dark hair and you know that, that it's easier to think of me uh, that way than as a as, as Riff, you know. Uh, well, but also, yeah. if, if you had been Riff in the film, what I meant was you might not have won an Academy Award. I mean, it, well, you were meant to do, yeah. this was your course. This was well, your... Uh, again, you know, uh, in, uh, in the theater version and in the film version, the best role is Anita. That's just, that's just the best part, because for different reasons. Uh, the good thing about the role of Bernard in the film is because he, th there was more meat on the bones. You saw different aspects of him. You saw how he was treated by Shrank in the drugstore. I mean, the, the, these poor guys were treated so badly. Uh, and uh, I, so that really gave you something to play and something important to think about too. And for audiences to connect with, I think too. Uh, so it was a, it's a, it's a more dynamic, dynamic role, uh, in, uh, because of uh, the way it was enhanced. But it, it is a better role. Well, speaking of Anita, um, it, it's beautiful to see that you and Rita Moreno have endured the test of time and are still yeah. so close and yeah. and yeah. so lovely together. Did yeah. you know Rita when you started filming the, the movie? No, the first, my first day uh, reading, meeting uh, Rita was our first day of rehearsal for the movie. <laughs> wow. And uh, we all had such a great time with each other, but r there were th uh, Rita, Rita, and a girl called Yvonne Othon Wilder. The three of us just glued to each other and we're always been con and uh, uh, during the shoot and uh, privately too and we've all we've remained really good friends over the years we by the way the entire cast of west side story has always remained close all of us no matter where we are if we have a if there's a, a chance to see each other we jump at the chance because we all share such a great experience you know okay but now isn't it true george that that during the filming the jets and the sharks were told to stay apart, even when you were doing it on on stage, right? To not fraternize yeah. together. Yeah, well, that that started with Jerry Robbins. I remember the first day of rehearsal for the London Company, where I was going to play mm -hmm. Riv. The very first rehearsal day, Jerry got everybody on the stage, 
in a semicircle around him. And he said, okay, we've got three weeks to do this. And so that wasn't much time. So we all had to learn and work fast. I got right. scared because I thought I was going to be too slow. But that's, that day, Jerry, I'll paraphrase slightly. He said, I want the Jets to stay over there. I want the Sharks to stay over there. I don't want you socializing during rehearsal breaks for lunch, even after the show. Wow. And, but So that was a very uh, strong directorial uh, 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 way of working to right. uh, keep the tension and and that is necessary in this piece, and he was right. But Jerry started that in the theater, and of course, uh, and and it uh, everybody kept that idea in the film as well. But I, that was Jerry's first directorial uh, issue, so to speak. And so at what point were you guys able to finally fraternize? Oh, my, well, listen, you, you couldn't help it. <laughs> you just couldn't help it. Yeah. Um, we were playing one-upsmanship things on each other all the time. In fact, that was part of what we wanted to do. We'd surprise each other with something. And once we did something, then they would have to counter it with something <laughs> else. And it just kept going. But it kept the competition alive in a in a playful, but at the same time, serious way when, the, when it came to work too. So that was an ongoing game. It was fun. It, well, it, it, I, I, I watched a good part of it today and I listened to the entire score, the soundtrack. I mean, I, I, how could it not be fun? What a brilliant, uh, it, it's just, there's nothing yeah. like it. There's well, nothing like it. I'll tell you, it. Everybody, Everybody, everybody loved what they were doing. And Natalie was so amazing. She was so beautiful and so, so beautiful in this role. Tell, okay, so tell me about that, George, because she got a lot of flack because she didn't do her own singing. Well, was that hard for her on the set? Well, I don't know what it's like for my, I, there are some things here that I, I would like you, I've heard, but I've never actually known. I've right. never gotten it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Right. But uh, I, I, understood that Natalie did record and worked to her voice for the filming. Uh, and then they thought this voice has to be a little bit better. And that's mm -hmm. how they brought Marnie Nixon. And by the way, the idea of, of a, a star, an actress, not singing for herself was done a zillion times. Well, yeah, Audrey like, Hepburn in My Fair Lady also. Yeah, sure. I'll tell you, I, th I, I think a really great one is Rita Hayworth and Gilda, her her singing was done by Anita Ellis, and it's per, who cares? <laughs> who else could have done that part the way she did? Does, right. the, does the singing really matter? No, it, it as an audience, it doesn't to me. Uh, uh, the product is what we see, and and they ha, however you get there to make it good to me is irrelevant. I don't need to. I I think you limit yourself in casting mm -hmm. if you insist that that girl that the part has to be it has to be her voice because that means you're if if you find somebody who who's really wonderful for the part but doesn't have that great a voice and then you start looking for a voice then you start making uh, you start uh, minimizing uh, things I'm not putting it to I I. So, but anyway, uh, Sid Charisse uh, very rarely, if ever, sang in a film. Vera Ellen, they were dancers, and but it didn't matter. It was very accepted. No one thought about it twice. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Was Natalie one of the, was she one of the company? Because she was already a big star. Was she, was she one of the company? Did she? Ab no, she, she was one of the company. She was. And by the way, she was all of 23 at the time, you know. Um, and sh she was great. She was friend. And sh listen, she was intelligent. She was highly intelligent. Mm. She was a gifted actress. And, and to me, one of the things about about Natalie, and I'll say even about Audrey Hepburn too. Aside from their uh, intelligence and their acting ability, they had a, a personal quality that just uh, uh, enhanced anything that they did. Uh, it was impossible not to love Audrey Hepburn in anything. She was just, and I think the same with, with uh, Natalie. So not everybody has that and draws uh, us to them and the way, but I think they're two really wonderful examples of uh, how 
uh, a personal quality uh, that is just natural uh, can be such a uh, incredible ad addition to uh, someone's performance. Yeah. Another woman, another actress that you speak of the, in this way in your book is Judy Garland, who you also worked with. Tell us about Judy. Oh my God. Well, she's she's something else altogether. Oh. I mean, you know, the the word genius is yeah, is not, um, not a word to toss around. There are two people. Uh, Jerry Robbins, I think, was a genius, mm -hmm. and so was Judy Garland. Mm -hmm. Judy Garland was absolutely. I mean, uh, you. I remember I assisted the choreographer on her first uh, appearance in Vegas. So I, I never talked to her, but I was around her for a few weeks and watched her work. And yeah, and I, I remember thinking that when when she looks at you, she can really see you. You know, wow. uh, it wasn't intimidating. It could have been. But but uh, I mean, when I see her in anything now, I'm it's just another reminder of how how incredible she was, how incredible. I mean, just thrilling. Did you see any of, did you did you see the movie with Renee Zellweger where she portrayed her? Portrayed who, sorry? Renee Zellweger, two years ago, she did, she, she played Judy in the film. I can't remember the name of the movie, but she was Judy and it was kind of a, a pretty sad um, depiction I'm, of her. I'm, I'm sorry, this, now I'm hearing another voice that's, was kind of stronger. So ask me that. I don't know. I wish I knew how to get rid of it. I don't. I'm so ask me sorry. that again. I, I hope, you know, we're having sound issues. I'm not using my microphone today. It's not you. It's not you. It's it, it's I, it's something I've done. Ah, I'm sorry. And I don't know how to stop it. <laughs> uh, I was asking you if you saw the film that uh, with Renee Zellweger when she, she played Judy a couple of years ago. Oh, I, I did. Um, and was that accurate? I, 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 was I, I that like accurate her. for you? I, I like, I really like Renee Zellweger. I really mm -hmm. like her. Um, my, I was having a hearing problem at the time. So the thing I couldn't appreciate because I couldn't hear it the way I should was the singing. And I've never, I've never gone back to hear it. I, so I don't remember her, Renee Zellweger's singing. I don't, I, I didn't hear it well enough to be able to talk about it. But I thought if you're playing Judy Garland, <laughs> I mean, singing is a tremendous part of who she was. Absolutely. But I, 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 I liked what she did as an actress. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, 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 she's another likable person. Was um was was there a sadness to Judy when you worked with her? Uh, was there a what? Sorry. A sadness. Was a was there a sadness to her? Because she she became such a tragic figure when you were working with her. Did you no, see that at all? No, no. no. When I what, listen, I got to be around her really just that one time. <laughs> she first of all, she learned everything so fast. I wow, mean, she learned it almost before it was over. Yeah, and and she was you know she I don't know if she she was very funny. She had an incredible sense of humor, and, and uh, she she did some uh, interviews and talks with with uh, Jack Parr. Very very funny stuff. You know, in this uh, the show in Vegas, she had eleven male dancers because uh, the opening number, each one of them held had a pole with a big letter on it because at the end of the opening number song. All those letters spelled Judy Garland. <laughs> so, so, but so my point is, so she had, she loved talking to the guys, spending time with them, laughing, joking. She was, she was great. Liza came to rehearsal and Liza. Tell us about 13, Liza. 13 or 14. And she wanted to learn everything too. And she, like her mom, she learned, bam, she learned so fast. She was a, 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 and she was only thirteen or fourteen, but uh, so yeah, Liza, Liza's something too. But if I'm if I had to pick between the two of them, I would always pick Judy Garland first. Wow. <laughs> and I'm sure she wouldn't mind. But just be, you know, a few nights ago, a movie from I don't know what you're uh, called, Summer Stock, with mm -hmm. uh, Judy Garland and and uh, Gene Kelly. Yes. You know, I, I, I did a, 
uh, a theater production of a show called Company. Mm -hmm. uh, a Stephen you were movie. Bobby. I love Company, yeah. and I would yeah. love to have seen yeah. you as Bobby. Wow. Yeah. And I, Elaine Stritch was in it. You know, El another one. Ladies another to lunch. One. Oh my and, God. And she. I remember one night we were in San Francisco. It was during a break and her television was on. And I think it was the Ed Sullivan show and Judy Garner was singing. And that's what Elaine did. She just said, that, that wasn't anything to say. She was so incredible, there were no words, you know. So Elaine was a, a, a great admirer of Judy Garland too, you know. Yeah. I got to meet Elaine uh, a few years before she passed. What a woman, I got to hear her speak and, um, wow, you did company with Elaine. Oh my God, what I wouldn't give to have seen that. How fantastic. You must have been an incredible Bobby. I, I had a great, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing about doing that show for almost a year was, was uh, being around Elaine, get, uh, working with her and getting to know her and spending a lot of time. Uh, it, it was a ball. It was a ball. Thanks to her. It was, it was just wonderful. Yeah. Wow. And you also, another woman like that, when you talked about Judy's sense of humor, Debbie Reynolds, one of the funniest women I've ever, uh, you, God, I'm so sorry. Ask me that again. Debbie, I brought up Debbie Reynolds as another woman who had incredible sense of humor, so much talent. Yes. And uh, uh, Singing in the Rain was on a couple of nights ago. She was, how old was she? 19 or and look how fun, how what a talent she was. Good, she's so wonderful. And by the way, a great figure and great legs. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Really great legs. Yeah. There's a story in your book about seeing Elvis. Can you tell yeah. us about Elvis? Yeah. Well, well, I was under contract to Paramount for a while, so we could wander around the lot and watch people filming. And uh, and he would he they were filming him just by himself singing blue suede shoes. And I sat somewhere and, and watched him do that test. And I, re, uh, I remember he was aware of people in the room around him in a really nice way. Uh, and I could see that when he looked at any of us, he, was, he seemed really gracious, really like a nice person. And at the same time, doing a great job with that song. He, he was he was pretty phenomenal too. He was an extraordinary presence. Yeah, yeah. Sp speaking of presence, you talk about Marlena Dietrich. You met you, wow. uh, what? What yeah. was Marlena like? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, doing company. Uh, one of the uh, actresses in it. Uh, 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 her name is Marty Stevens. Her real name is Marty Skank. She's from the the Skank motion picture family you if you look up that word skank you'll you'll see i, th I don't know if it's her uncle or her father were tremendous they almost started movies in this country but so marty and she had a great voice so almost from the first day of rehearsal we just gravitated to each other and became friendly like right away and and she was just she was wonderful and because she grew up in around all those famous people, she was very friendly with a lot of those people. Uh, and so uh, one day uh, at, after rehearsal, uh, Noel Coward was a good friend of hers. And he was in town with some friends and she invited me to join them for a drink and for something to eat after rehearsal. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was before the show. So Elaine joined us too. So it was Elaine and Marty and uh, Noel Cowan, a couple of his friends and me. And I didn't say anything, I just listened, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and sh but Dietrich, uh, you know, the word, the word always got, Dietrich was of course a, a very, very close friend of hers too. And so we were, and I, I had heard about that. So I, um, we were in San Francisco by this time and I had some friends from London who were in town and we agreed to go meet each other after the show that night to have dinner and talk. And, uh, and so that was the plan. And, uh, you know, Elaine Stritch uh, in her one moment show talks about leaving the dressing room door open. She said, I always do. It gets lonely back there. Aww. So, so I learned from Elaine to keep my dressing room door open. <laughs> so it, it was open. So, and one, one night before a show, we're all getting ready. And Marty Stevens very quickly came to the door and she said, I, 
She said, I have a, I have a friend who's in town and I'd love you to join us for dinner after the show if you can. You know? And I said, Marty, I'm sorry, I have friends from London. So I, thank you, I, I, I have other I, I have other plans. And she said, that's okay, another time. She never, she was not a name dropper. She never, she, she didn't mention Dietrich's name. She just, I have a friend. If you can't make it, that's okay, another time. Okay, so that was that. And then later, Five minutes later, I saw Elaine's dressing room was just down the hall for me. And I saw this blonde figure go by. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, that's Dietrich. And I said, no. <laughs> anyway, we worked it out. We worked it out. <laughs> so I so I we got to spend two nights with her. Wow. Uh, first night over dinner at Trader, Trader Vicks. She was very quiet the first night. And so, and we thought that was the only night we were, we were going to see her. So when it was over, we all said good night. How nice to have met you, and all that. And so the next night, I'm in the theater again, getting ready. And she put her head in the doorway, and she, Dietrich did. And she said, "I decided to stay another day." And she, by the way, and uh, during the show, she was in the wings watching watching the show. Um, and as as Bobby, uh, the character I played, is on stage all the time. So I'm never in the dressing room right and the guy who was in my my dresser really nice guy john uh what talked to her and evidently she found dietrich found out that it was john's birthday and evidently said if i'd known it was your birthday i would have gotten you something and he said and so what he talked her into doing as a birthday gift to him was letting elaine introduce her to the audience at, after the show was over so and she agreed to do it so he fluffed yeah. up her hair a little put a little no makeup ready she, flat shoes slacks you know uh, but wow um and and the, the the curtain calls for that show you know it's the single guy the bachelor and all his married friends right so so the curtain call was always all the married friends down here on the stage level and bobby up here by himself right so so you know, I love what the way Elaine introduced. She never said her name, but this is what she said. She stepped forward and she stopped the applause and she said, "We have someone uh, who's uh, been with us uh, for about two nights now, cleaning the dressing rooms and sweeping the stage." <laughs> and then, and, and then all she did was this. She didn't say her name. And then Dietrich stood up right next to me. No, no photographer. <laughs> So I don't have a so she, so, and when the audience saw her, they recognized her and it, and so at the end of the and then after the show, we all oh went God. to a piano bar place, a great place across the street and and we all sat down and drinking wine and having and Elaine because Elaine always loved staying in hotels and so she, because she thought it was going to be a late night, she had a uh, a turkey sandwich in case room services closed. Anyway, so I as so I was sitting, uh, I'm sitting right next to D, and D, and she was very talkative that night. She was having a, a nice time, and she actually got up and she sang. She sang Lily Marlene. Oh my and, god! And Marty said, she never does that. Oh my! So god. I I always thought when I in retrospect I thought that was a she must have felt comfortable enough to, with us to do that. So that anyway, so. Um, Anyway, she was in, she was incredible. So what an amazing woman! Yeah. Wow. So another amazing woman that you, uh, Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah. Wow. Well, I never got to speak to her, but uh, I stood next to her for about four minutes <laughs> when she was about sixteen. Uh, it, was, it was when I was working uh, in the choir scene for a Song of Love. Mm -hmm. uh, we walked around when we there was a break, and some of us, few of us, walked over uh, to a, a sound stage where Mario Lanza was recording, and she was there too with a couple of people, just quiet, just that. So I never spoke to her, but I remember seeing her when she was what fifteen or sixteen. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah, but that was it. That was it. I I've often thought to myself, I wish, I I uh, I've often thought. If Elizabeth Taylor was your friend, you would have a fierce and loyal friend. Mm. You no, know, I always thought that about her. Yeah. And I think she was. Yeah. How about working with Rosalind Russell, another powerful powerhouse of a woman, Rosalind Russell? 
Oh, well, I never got to talk to her either, but wow, she, yeah, she, <laughs> yeah, she, God, uh, th these people, these actresses who are so iconic and just really wonderful at, at, uh, and, and, and special, they're, they're one of a kind, really, almost all of them. There's no one else like them. Um, she, there were, she did two numbers. That was in, uh, uh, what was that movie called? Uh, I can't think what the movie was called with Fernando Lamas and and uh, Gloria De Haven, The Girl Rush. It was called. Thank yeah. you. And the, the the producer of The Girl Rush was the same producer, the same man who produced White White Christmas, and the choreographer on The Girl Rush was the same choreographer who had done White Christmas. Anyway, so uh, I never got to speak to her because everybody's working, but uh, she was. Uh, a dynamic presence and just really kind. She was really good and just an incredible professional, really, really doing, again, working, thinking of her, of her work, you know. Yeah. You tell a lovely story in the book about, um, about Danny Kay. Um, yes, about Danny Kay. Danny Kay. Don't you tell a story in the book about Danny? Am I making this up? I think I think he did something lovely for you, didn't he? You you mean Danny Kay, right? I, yeah. I, okay, I'm still hearing stuff. So uh. yeah, I, I'll tell you. Yeah, you know the the four stars on uh, on White Christmas, Danny Kay, Vera Ellen, Rosemary Clooney, and Bing Crosby, all really liked each other and had a great time with each other. Um, uh, the, he did a, a movie after that called uh, The Court Jester. Uh, and uh, I was hired to learn some of the movement that he did and then teach it to him. And he was just a, a, really, a really nice man. I, he probably didn't meet me around for anything, but he was gracious and nice. He was funny. He, he gave me a uh, and when he found out that uh, that Paramount was going to test me, he gave me a pair of gold cufflinks. I still have them, monogram cufflinks. So oh. th I mean, how uh, that's a really exceptional kind of gesture for someone to do for anybody, especially for this kid, you know. But and uh, his wife was around a lot because mm -hmm. she wrote so much of his material. And I remember one day we, let's see, Danny and his wife. Uh, and Robert Alton, the choreographer, and Joan Bailey, Bob's female assistant, the most important assistant, and I, just the five of us, were in Danny's dressing room on the lot. It was on the ground. And uh, we're, there's, there's a doorway over here. <laughs> and Jerry Lewis, as a joke, backed into the room. Nobody knew it was going to, backed into the room like, like he had just caught a ball. <laughs> and, and he looked over. I think he, he was waiting for a laugh or something. Nobody did anything. Everybody was just silent. <laughs> and then he just left. <laughs> I, it was funny. I guess nobody thought it was funny. I don't know. But but, 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 but Danny was, was, yeah, wow. Now, and, how uh, was Bing Crosby? Was, well, because he had a pretty serious reputation. Was, what was he like to work with? Well, he would, I, again, I, I had no contact of any kind with him. None of us did. But the thing that I noticed was how much they all liked working with each other, the four mm -hmm. stars. They mm -hmm. all, I think they already had a good time. They liked what they were doing and they really liked each other. Uh, but the thing that you couldn't help but notice about that is what you kind of noticed about him on the screen and what, with what an ease mm -hmm. he kind of did everything. Mm -hmm. But really, and he was, I mean, he was really quite terrific. But he, everything he did, uh, well, it was just so incredibly natural, I suppose. I'm not saying it too well, but I, no, you're I didn't know anything well. else. I didn't know anything else about him. So mm -hmm. when when thinking about him at all, you you saw who he was and how they all were with each other. And because they liked each other, I thought that spoke well of all of them, you know. Mm -hmm. Speaking of ease, when I think of ease and your list of people that you've worked, Gene Kelly. Gene Kelly strikes me as having great ease. Did, did he? I'm so, I, Gene Kelly. I'm so sorry. That's okay. I know the sound is bad. Gene Kelly. Did he have the ease? Because he strikes me as someone that had ease. 
Well, I'll tell you what, uh, let's see. Um, I worked with him. I was a chorus dancer in, in Brigadoon in mm -hmm. one <coughs> big sequence. Where, um, and then uh, four guys were involved in, in the sword dance uh, that Gene choreographed and directed. It was cut from the film. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that we were more, we were closer to him because it was just the star, Hugh Lang in, in the middle mm -hmm. and the four of us around him. And G he, I'll tell you, Gene was great because we were doing uh, Scottish dancing on the sword. And that kind of uh, dancing, you're on the balls of your feet all the time. Wow. So you you get what are called shin splints, which are really painful. And Gene was a dancer and he knew that and he really did everything he could to make us comfortable. He got us orange mm -hmm. juice. I mean, wow. The point is he was really kind, he was really gracious. And, and uh, the only other time I was around him was in a, a French movie musical called The Young Girls of Rochefort. I didn't have any scenes with him in the movie but of course we saw each other and talked and uh, socialized and again he was uh i think he was sort of uh, uh putting off getting ready for the film but of course he did uh but he was married to a woman whose name was Judy, uh, Jeannie Coyne C O Y N E and uh, one day i got a uh kind of like a letter from her i'd never met her before it was a letter and with the, and there was a card and also enclosed was a can of corned beef hash. His birthday, his birthday was coming up uh -huh. and his favorite breakfast was eggs and corned beef hash. So <laughs> she sent me that stuff asking me if I could please arrange a nice birthday for him. So with the, the cook, the guy in the hotel, we, we, it, was a, it was a beautiful tray with a single rose and a card that she had for him and breakfast with corned beef hash. So we had so much fun doing this for him. And he, he thought she was there, <laughs> but she wasn't. Anyway, we, that's, I remember that. Uh, and I, I like the idea that his wife uh, took the trouble to try and create that for him for his birthday. That's really <clears throat> lovely. I, I didn't get to know him at all, but I thought he was a, he was a strict professional and had uh, immense taste and judgment in everything he did. Um, and he he knew movie musical, he knew how, how, he knew filming musical numbers better than anybody. And, and uh, the director of that film, <coughs> Jacques Demy, who was also a really talented guy, was working in just the opposite way that Gene was used to. Uh, Gene, in creating a musical number, would know in the rehearsal process exactly where the camera would be for each particular section. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have to do long takes for that section. Uh, Jacques Demy, didn't know how he was going to edit until he saw everything. So you had to do long takes of stuff that would probably never be used. And Gene wasn't crazy about that because he knew uh, what would be used and what wouldn't. But Jacques Demy was the director, so we had to do, do it his way. And, and Gene uh, uh, didn't love that aspect, just mm -hmm. technically. But he, he was right. But Jacques Demy turned out to be right too because his editing was so good that mm -hmm. however he uh, arrived at it, he did, uh, he did, he did uh, edit musical numbers very well. So George, we're, I, I've been keeping you a long time, but I have a, just a couple more things. So I know that Shirley Jones is the one who gave you your Academy Award. I, I watched it again today. Shirley was in my living room a few years ago. Against you were you were nominated with Montgomery Cliff, yeah. George C. Scott, yeah. Peter Falk, and Jackie <laughs> Gleason. Yeah. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. What was your family? I mean, I can't even imagine going back. Home. Did did your family appreciate um, that this is that? I can't even imagine what that must have been like for you. Well, I, I'll tell you, I think uh, I was as naive as my family. I didn't understand the, uh, I didn't understand that aspect of things as I was too new to everything mm -hmm. myself. Uh, although I, I think I did have, because I was a, a especially a, a fan of, of Montgomery Clift and, and someone else, just as an actor, I loved his work. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, uh, and I sort of, the word was out. I knew that it was a, a hot year, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, and it was. Uh, and so uh, I, I, you know, t t uh, when I went to the Academy Awards with Rita, we attended together. Mm -hmm. Boy, did we have such a great time. But I, I, in, in trying to talk about this thing and how it all felt is uh, uh, my way of uh, speaking about that is if you buy a lottery ticket, you really don't expect to win. Somewhere you just kind of hope you might. So uh, I, so, but winning, losing, none of it crossed my mind. I just knew that something nice was happening to me. <laughs> That's really kind of how naive I was. I didn't understand how important that was in the business even as well, even then. Uh, so, uh, but in retrospect, um, yeah, the, uh, that and in uh, in in Rita's category as well. It was another hot year. Judy Garland, yeah, uh, it, it was a that was a, a strong year. Yeah, I think in all categories, pretty much. So, and we both got lucky, and we both attended uh, together. We've both been friends ever since. I'm still godfather to her, to her daughter. Aww. So we had a great night. What can I say? You know, it, yeah. And West Side Story is was the winningest musical of say the Say that Academy again, I'm sorry. Award. It wasn't, isn't West Side Story the winningest um, Academy Award winning musical? I think still. You mean the new one? No, yours won more Academy Awards than any musical oh, ever. Yeah, yeah, well, let's see. It won 10. Uh, I think it was Ben-Hur that got 11. So that's the most. Uh, but that's picture. not a musical. You're, that's, that's right. But right. You're, you're right. West Side Story was the first musical to get that many. But musical or not, it was, it was a, a impressive thing. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. And so how do you feel about I mean, I can't even imagine seeing a remake of it. I, I don't know if I can go. How do you feel about him doing well, that? Well, I'll tell you, I, just over time, I've thought different things. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, uh, you know, Steven Spielberg is a, is a superb movie maker. So mm -hmm. he, he, I'm certain he's going to do something really wonderful because he must have thought long and hard before he even took this on. And he, he I'm, I'm assuming he must have thought <laughs> I, I'd like to do, he, he must have imagined what he could change or make to, uh, to do today because he, he's, he's an intelligent man, you know. Uh, so I expect, I really do expect that he's going to produce something um, really good. And, uh, you know, there's so much, filmmaking has changed a lot over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so... Just cinematically, I, I, I sh also uh, I think I I don't really know. I you, you hear stuff, um, but I understand one of the, one of the numbers he's not doing is I feel pretty. What I, I don't know why, but I, I don't know. Maybe that's not even maybe that's not true. It's just wow. something I've heard. Mm -hmm. But but uh, the, the to me uh, the thing that. Uh, about him doing this movie, uh, I, I just kind of would like for anybody who pays attention to it to recognize that, look what he had to work with. You know, the play has already been there, the movie. So he's not starting from scratch. Right. He sees something that he can do something with, but, but he's not creating it. All that hard work and months and years was done a long time ago by Arthur Lawrence, uh, Leonard Bernstein, of course, Stephen Sonner, and Jerome Robbins. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is Jerry Robbins. It, the, the idea of taking Romeo and Juliet and making it in, into a modern day young, that was Jerry's idea. Wow. Was I, I was reading in your book that originally it was going to be a Jewish um, right, they were going to do a Jew East Side story. I was reading in your book about that, right? Yeah, they ha it, it, in in arriving finally at West Side Story, it went through different things, and mm -hmm. that was one of them. Uh, I think at one point they thought of it, it would be a, a like sort of like AB's Irish Rose or something, but but they as they 
you know, in the creating process, uh, changes were made and they ended up, and it's good that they did with the, the version that they ended up with. But, but my point is this piece was created by Genius. Robbins. Genius. That's yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, the only, the thing I kind of take it personally in a way is I don't want people to forget that. Mm -hmm. I want them to know who created this piece. And anybody can do whatever they want with it, as long as they admit and pay tribute to the people who did create it. I think Steven Spielberg is doing that. I'm not sure, but I hope he is. I hope he is. There will never be another Bernardo. I don't care who does it. <laughs> you own that. You will always oh. own it. That red shirt and those oh. black pants. Oh. That, that is you. You are Bernardo. You will always be oh. you. By the way, George, you look astounding. You are still so handsome. And I, I know how old you are. And I absolutely do not believe it for one second. You <laughs> are a marvel. You are incredible. Truly. I'm blown away. And I'm, I'm being a, a fangirl now. I just can't oh. believe that I've gotten to spend this time with you. And I hope that Post pandemic, I'll get to to meet you in person and to tell you that to your face. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this. It has been such a joy to spend this time with you. Thanks. And Thanks. I, I really want you to make that bracelet with the heart because I want it. <laughs> I want to buy one. I just love it. Thank you so much, George. Have a happy and healthy Thanksgiving. Uh, thank, thank you, honey. Thank you so I, much. And I'll, and I'll make that heart bracelet. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, Thank everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.